There Will Be Wolves by Carlene Bradford. Chapter 3 Ursula stared at the open trap door and waited for the shouts of discovery. Incredibly, there were none. Instead, the men trooped back up, looking confused and angry. I could have sworn, the leader began. Then he scowled at Ursula. It seems you speak the truth. I would have lain down my life that there was someone hidden there. He pushed past her and strode out the door, his gang of ruffians close behind him. Ursula made a move toward the open door, but just then Bruno groaned. She went over to him quickly and knelt to help him. He sat up groggily, holding his head with both hands. Beside him, Samson whimpered and scrabbled closer. "'Are you all right?' Ursula asked anxiously. "'I'm not sure,' he answered. "'My head hurts.' He tried to stand, but then sat back down. "'My head certainly does hurt,' he repeated. Then he seemed to come to his senses. "'What happened?' he asked. "'Where are those men? Did they find David?' "'They've gone,' Ursula answered. "'Father took David and hid in the cellar. "'I don't know why they didn't find them. "'There is no hiding place down there. "'But somehow they didn't. "'Maybe you underestimate your father, my dear.' Ursula looked up in surprise to see Master William emerging from the trap door, David close behind. Her father had a triumphant smile on his face. "'Father, where?' "'Don't you remember the stories about this house, daughter?' her father answered. He turned to Bruno. "'When our Emperor Henry was but a small boy, the Archbishop of Cologne, Bishop Anno it was then, had him brought here to Cologne and hid him away.' The archbishop's desire was to control the emperor, and thereby gain power over the Holy Roman Empire itself, of course, and for a while he was successful. No one could discover where he had hidden the boy king, but rumor has it that it was in this very house. I, for one, am inclined to believe it, although Ursula scorns the idea. What do you think now, daughter? Master William looked positively gleeful. Where were you? Ursula demanded. I know there's no hiding place down there, but obviously there is. David knows now, don't you, lad? The old man laughed and, to Ursula's fury, would say no more. David sank down beside Samson. When do you think I can return to my uncle's house? He asked with a worried look at Bruno. Stay here for now, Bruno answered. He tried to rise again and this time managed it, although with a grimace of pain. I'll go and find out what is happening, but in the meantime, you must stay out of sight. I don't imagine those men will be back, and don't let anyone else see you. We know not who is a friend and who is an enemy in this case. He's right, David. If Mistress Elke or that busybody next door happened by and saw you, the tale would be all over town in minutes that you are still here. Run upstairs and keep out of sight. We'll let you know when it is safe for you to go out. Reluctantly, David headed for the stairs. Bruno made as if to leave, but Ursula stopped him. Before you go, let me tend to that bump on your head. You gave it a fair crack, I think. Bruno started to protest, but no one argued with Ursula when she had her mind made up. Back in command of herself in the situation, she pushed him down onto a straw pallet in the corner, poured out a mug of boiling water from the pot hanging over the fire, and after consulting her healing book, threw in a handful of herbs. Lavender for the pain and rue for the dizziness. She explained as it brewed. When she judged it to be ready, she handed the mug full of concoction to Bruno. He sipped and made a face. Drink it, Ursula commanded, while I make the poultice for the bump. Catmint helps bruises. By the time Bruno forced the drink down, Ursula had the poultice ready. A large, ugly bump was coming up on his forehead just above the right eye. Ursula felt it gently, and then began to smooth and rub the catmint paste over it. Bruno winced, but remained silent. Suddenly, the stray cat appeared. It sidled over to Ursula and began to wind itself around her ankles more and more excitedly. Ursula laughed. You smell the cat mint, do you, you rascal? Well, have some, then. She put a small amount of the paste on the tip of one finger and rubbed it on the cat's paw. Immediately, the cat went into a frenzy of rolling, licking, and pouncing at imaginary mice. Totally ignoring Samson, who was whining indignantly in the corner while being held back with some difficulty by Master William, the little cat was soon in a delirium of delight. "'I'll go now,' Bruno said finally when Ursula had bound his head to her satisfaction. "'Keep David out of sight and I'll return as soon as possible.' 
No sooner had he left than Ursula heard excited voices approaching. A group of girls her own age paused by the trestle where the herbs were displayed. Ursula's book lay open among the bowls. "'What do you think of all the commotion, Ursula?' one of them, a bright-eyed, pert girl, asked. "'It seems to have calmed down now, and we're off to the marketplace to gather news. Will you come?' Ursula looked at them in dismay. "'If David should appear—' "'No, Britta,' she answered quickly. "'I have no time for that. I have work to do.' Her thoughts were with David, and the words were abrupt, even rude. The girl's face darkened. Truth, I forgot. You are not like the rest of us useless things, are you? You are an important person. Her voice dipped sarcasm. Then her eyes fell on the book. A clever person, she went on. A person who can read. Of course you don't have time for us and our foolish talk. She tossed her head and turned to the others. Come away, then. Mistress Ursula has work to do. Ursula bit her lip, then shrugged. She knew Britta and the other girls her age resented her and found her proud, but she really had nothing in common with them. Gossip and the pursuit of a husband was all they really seemed to care about. It was several hours before Bruno came back, and when he did, his face was pale. "'What is it?' Ursula asked with a sudden, terrible sense of misgiving. "'What has happened? Is David still here?' "'Yes, what's wrong?' "'Something terrible,' Bruno shook his head slowly from side to side. "'Something terrible,' he repeated. "'With an effort he straightened up. "'I must go to David. I must tell him.' "'But David, who had been watching for him, bounced, bounded down the stairs. "'Bruno, have you seen my mother and uncle? "'Is it safe for me to go to them now?' "'Bruno looked at him. He tried to speak, then stopped. "'He made another effort. "'Your mother,' he began. "'Your uncle.' He stopped again and closed his eyes, as if in even greater pain than before. "'What? What is it?' Bruno opened his eyes again and drew a deep breath to brace himself. "'They're both dead,' he said. "'All the members of your uncle's household. It seems they didn't make it to the bishop's church in time, and they were overrun by the mob.' Master William let out a cry and reached to hold David. David didn't seem to notice. He stared at Bruno unbelievingly. "'Dead?' he echoed. My uncle? My mother? Yes. His face went white. For a moment he stood, immobile. Then, without another word, he tore himself loose from Master William and disappeared upstairs. Ursula made as if to go after him. It might be best to leave him alone for now, Bruno said. But he will need someone. Go to him in a few minutes. But first, listen to me. There's more to tell. Very few of the Jews in Cologne were killed. Most of the citizens did as you and your father did and hid them until the frenzy was over. But David's family? It would seem that the crusaders had help there. What do you mean? Ursula asked. They say that Count Emil himself had a hand in the massacre of David's family. I can't believe that, Master William exclaimed. But why? Ursula began. The Count owed a vast sum of money to David's uncle. It might have been a good way to settle the debt. That's impossible, Master William put in. The Count may be a harsh man, but he would not stoop to such a thing. Ursula's mouth twisted. I'm not so certain of that as you are, father, she said. Bruno continued. The talk is that Count Emile knows there was a boy visiting as well, and he knows that the boy escaped and is hidden somewhere in the city. His own men are looking for David now. David is in more danger than ever. "'Then we'll hide him again,' Ursula said fiercely. "'They'll not take David from here, I swear to that.' "'This cannot be true,' Master William was shaking his head in disbelief. "'You must be wrong, my son. "'You must just be idle talk and rumours. "'I wish it were, Master, but afraid it sounds true to me.' "'Bruno turned back to Ursula. "'It might not be so easy to hide David again,' he said. "'Everyone knows that he comes here to see his dog.' They'll be back and they'll search with much greater determination next time. They can search all they want. They'll not get David from here. Ursula swung around and ran up the stairs to the boy. Toward nightfall, the street seemed to quieten down a little. Ursula and Bruno conferred and came to the decision that nothing more was likely to happen until the next morning at least. Bruno left, promising to return as early as possible with whatever the latest news might be. Ursula fixed up a small pallet in the corner of her room for David. She was prepared to defend him with her life if need be, 
but for most of the night all she could do was listen to him sobbing. Nothing she could say would comfort him. Finally, he seemed to sleep, and, exhausted, she did as well. When Ursula woke, however, and looked over toward the corner, David was gone. In a panic, she threw back her cover and raced downstairs. Samson was snoozing beside the fire as usual, her father already preparing the morning's work. David, she cried, he's gone. It's all right, her father answered. He left during the night. Left? Where to? He felt he must go back to his father in Maine's. He had to let his father know what has happened. To Maine's? He's going all the way to Maine's by himself? But there are crusaders roaming all over the countryside. He'll be in terrible danger. I could do nothing to stop him. Master William busied himself with his herbs, his back to Ursula. His mind was made up. Anyway, by himself, he will probably have a good chance. Who pays any attention to one lone boy on the roads? I'm certain he will be all right. He sounded as if he was trying to convince himself as much as Ursula. But surely you could have done something, father. How could you let him go off alone? It was his decision, Ursula. It was not my place to stop him. Master William's voice rose. Besides, if what Bruno says is true, although I can still cannot bring myself to believe it, he would be in worse danger here. He caught himself and then went on with an obvious effort to make his tone calm. He asked me to bid you goodbye and thank you for your care and help. He couldn't take Samson with him because the dog is not yet well enough to make such a trip, but he asked me to beg you to care for him until he can return for him. In spite of his efforts, his voice trembled. He reached out to straighten some of the herbs on the shutter, but only succeeded in knocking a bag onto the floor. He knelt quickly to retrieve it, and then looked up at Ursula. His face suddenly seemed to collapse. His eyes stared at her, but as if not really seeing her. The crusade, he whispered. The crusade is to be a glorious endeavor. How could it be born out of such things, out of such evil? The house was searched repeatedly during the next week, but finally the men who were seeking David were convinced that he had indeed fled. Ursula worried and Samson pined, but there was no news of the boy and no real hope that there would be. There was no telling how long it would take him to reach Maine's, if he ever did, or how long it would take him to get word back to them of his safety. Talk in the town, meanwhile, was of little more than the crusade. Pope Urban had declared that it would officially start in late August. Most of the nobles and lords from all around the countryside were beginning to make their preparations for leaving at that time. Peter the Hermit, however, had other ideas. He was on fire with enthusiasm to start right away, and a goodly proportion of the people of Cologne were eager to support him. As well, his own following was so large and so unruly, even though there had been no further killings of Jews, that there were mutterings among the less enthusiastic that it would be to the city's own good to have them leave as soon as possible. The Archbishop of Cologne, for whatever reason, supported Peter in his decision. The enthusiasm quickly attained fever pitch. When Count Emile and several and several of the neighboring lords declared their intention of leaving with Peter as soon as possible, there was no containing the excitement. The town now swarmed with crusaders. The red cross was seen on nearly every shoulder and breast. Bruno continued to visit regularly, but he and Master William still disagreed about the crusade itself. I am concerned about my father, Ursula said one day. He had gone as usual to hear Peter speak. He hadn't missed one of the monk's gatherings. He thinks of nothing else but this crusade and leaves more and more of his work to me. I believe he has even forgotten the murder of the Jews. It is not like him. I agree, Bruno began, but was interrupted by a commotion in the street. He and Ursula looked out the door to see a group of angry women charging toward the house. Ursula was puzzled but relieved to see that Mistress Elke was not among them. Of late, as the time for the birth of her child had drawn near, the woman had taken an even more violent aversion toward Ursula. Whenever she felt ill, she blamed Ursula for handling her tisanes and infusions, although Ursula was scrupulously careful to avoid them. The last time Mistress Elke had visited their apothecary, she had tripped over Ursula's stray cat and fallen heavily. No amount of soothing or reasoning on the part of Master William had been able to convince her that Ursula had not had a hand in it. Ursula's relief was short-lived. 
Witch, the woman streaked as they advanced in a solid, hate-filled body toward her. Witch. Ursula stood, astonished, as they drew up in front of her and brandished their fists. Bruno instinctively took a step forward, as if to shield her. What is the meaning of this? he demanded. Mistress Elke's babe was born dead and monstrously deformed, like a demon, one of the women screamed. It's all this girl's doing. Mistress Elke says so herself, yelled another. That's not possible, Ursula flashed out the denial, but her heart sank. You put a curse on her, admit it, shrieked a woman. Ursula recognized Mistress Adelheid, the widow of a shoemaker. She was a vicious tongue virago who, it was wildly believed, had scolded and tormented her poor husband even on his deathbed. She seemed to be the leader of the group. Mistress Ingrid from next door, ever alert, rushed out to see what was going on and joined the group immediately. That's right, she chimed in. She said Mistress Elke was carrying a demon. The woman hastily made the sign against evil and crossed themselves as well. And she turned herself into a cat one day. I saw it myself. Only a witch could do that. Mistress Elke's serving girl, usually meek and craven, was in the security of this furious group, shouting just as loudly as the other, her face just as contorted. That's not true, Ursula cried out. She began to shake. I did nothing. At that moment, Master William appeared. He stared at the group of women in confusion. What? What is going on? Your daughter is a witch, Master William, and we'll prove it. For a moment, it seemed as if the woman would surge forward and seize Ursula right then and there, but her father, still bewildered, moved between them. Witch, the cry was raised once more. Witch, witch. The others took it up, but there was no one willing to push past Master William. You've not heard the last of this, my girl, Mistress Aldehid screeched finally. Nor have you, Master William. We're decent folk here and will not have the likes of this going on. The Archbishop himself will hear of this. He will decide what's to be done. Master William stared at the woman unbelievingly. Most of them had known and been treated by him for years. They had been friends and neighbors to his family for most of their lives. My ladies, he began feebly, there must be some mistake. There's been no mistake, and the Archbishop will not tolerate the devil's work in his own city, a voice shrieked at him in return. We'll be back, Miss Aldehyde promised. We'll be back, and then we'll see what's to be done. She whirled and strode away, with the crowd of muttering women following close behind. Ursula looked past her father to Bruno. I cannot believe this, she whispered, but a sick, twisting pain knotted her stomach, and she recognized it as fear. That night Ursula was awakened by a strange smell and the sound of Samson barking frantically at the bottom of the stairs. It took her a moment to collect herself, and then she realized that the room was rapidly filling with smoke. She sprang off her pallet and screamed to her father, who slept on the floor above. When he didn't answer, she raced for the ladder that connected the second floor to the third and was up it in an instant, shaking him awake. What? What is it, child? The old man was vague with sleep and almost incoherent. He had been so upset by the woman that Ursula had insisted he take a potion to help him rest. Now he could not seem to waken. She shook him harder. The smoke was getting thicker, reaching up to even this floor, and that a queer taste of it in the back of her throat was making her cough. Fire, father! The house is on fire! Oh, father, wake up! We must run! Samson was howling now. Master William sat up, still dazed, and Ursula dragged him to his feet. She pushed him over to the hole where the ladder was and thrust him toward it. He barely managed the rungs. Then she put her arm around his shoulders and helped him down the stairs. Samson was in a frenzy. The bottom floor was ablaze. Flames licked at the shelves with their store of dried herbs. Ursula seized her father tightly and fought her way through the smoke to the door. But she had to let go of him in order to open it, and he sank onto the floor. She pulled the door open, reached down, and half dragged, half carried him out. Samson charged out behind them. And Ursula remembered her book, her healing book. She dropped her father's arm and raced back into the house, ignoring the shouts of the people who were already collecting at the scene. The smoke was almost overpowering, but she ran for the stairs and pulled herself up them. The book was in a corner under her bed. Coughing, with tears streaming down her face, she reached for it. The whole wall beside her was in flames and the heat scorched her hand. She grasped the book and then almost fell back down the narrow stairway. She staggered out the door. The floor of the second level crashed down behind her. The whole neighborhood was awake by now, and shouts were being raised all up and down the street. 
Men raced up carrying buckets of water from a nearby well and began to throw it on the fire, but the smoke was too dense, and the heat of the flames soon drove them back. Watch out! The roof's going! Even as the shout was raised, the whole top of the house caved in, sending up a towering blaze that leaped for the sky. Now all the efforts of the dozens of people in the street were directed to wetting down the adjoining houses on either side in order to pre prevent the fire from spreading. Ursula could do nothing but stand, arms around her father, and watch as everything they owned in the world went up in flames. By the time the first light of day began to streak through the sky, it was all over. Their house was an empty, smoldering shell. Ursula stared at the wreckage. The houses on either side had been burned as well, but not extensively. By and large, they had been saved. People were standing, staring, or staying slumped in the street, silent and exhausted. Suddenly, a shout startled them all. There she is! There's the witch! Look! God has already laid his hand upon her. The women were back, but this time, ominously, they were led by the monks from the church of Great St. Martin's. One of the monks, surveying the burned out ruin, crossed himself and began to pray. God sent the fire! shrieked Mistress Aldahid. The fire that purifies! God sent it! Yes, cried another. He's burned the witch's house, and now the witch must burn.